Are you ready for the word of the Lord today? We're starting a new series called Jesus People, and I want to pray before you're seated that Jesus would be exalted in this place. Let me pray over you, and I, I'd ask you to open your heart wide to what the Holy Spirit would say to you today. God, we thank you for your church. We thank you that your presence is here. This is your time. Holy Spirit, I sense your nearness here, and you've come to reveal Jesus, to draw us close to yourself, to heal our wounds, to change our lives, to forgive us. Jesus, would you be exalted in these moments? Let us get out of the way. Father, I pray what John prayed, that I would decrease and you would increase. Help my heart and mind to communicate in the hearts of your people to receive and be exalted at every location today. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, before you're seated, turn to somebody next to you, all locations, tell them you look amazing and it's great to see you in church in June on a Sunday. This is where you need to be. <laughs> Woo! All right, well, I want to welcome you into a brand new series called Jesus People. And for the rest of the summer, we're going to be considering looking into the ministry years of Jesus, the ministry years of Jesus. The life of Jesus from the age of 30 to 33. Three years of itinerant ministry that changed the world, not only impacted his globe and his community while he walked among them, but his last, has created a lasting impact that's uh, for time and eternity. The, the visitation of Jesus to the planet has changed the world forever. How many of you can testify that that is true today? And we call it Jesus People for a couple reasons. It is a throwback to the Jesus movement of the, the late 60s and early 70s, the hippie era. Yes, I was there. Some of you remember it well. And uh, we're believing for a greater outpouring of the Jesus movement in our day, sweeping across California once again. How many of you up for that one? Uh, but the real reason we're calling it Jesus People is the way that the, the effect, the conversations, the miracles, the life and ministry of Jesus affects individuals from the famous to the homeless. He changes people from the average to the influential, from the, the poverty stricken to the wealthy, from the sick to the healthy, right? From those that uh, have no hope to those who feel like their life is all together. A contact with Jesus of Nazareth will change you for all time and eternity. And we're going to see that in the scripture. Let's just check today at all locations. How many of you have been personally impacted and changed by Jesus Christ? Come on. Come on, somebody. Yeah. So it's, it's my honor, it's my privilege to unpack this along with some of our other communicators uh, this summer because there's nobody like Jesus. This the God man, uh, he was fully man, but he was fully God and he came to earth, the savior, the redeemer and so many great titles. He is in fact, the prince of peace. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the eternal one. He's the living word of God. He is the great I am. He is the one that's worthy to break the seal and open the scroll and all the angels will cry out, holy, holy. He is the coming king. He's from everlasting to everlasting. There's nobody like Jesus. There never has been and there never will be. He is the son of God. He's the righteous one. He's my savior. He's my, that's my king. All right, moving on. Jesus, let's talk about him. Let's lift him up. Let me read you a bit of a, a, a poem that's been around for a while called One Solitary Life. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He worked until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book, he never held an office. He never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college. He never traveled more than 200 miles from his hometown. He did none of the things one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away when he was turned over to his enemies. He went through a mock trial and was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. After his execution, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Now, some 20 centuries have come and gone. And today, he still remains the central figure of all human history. Of all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together, they have not affected humanity as much as the one solitary life of Jesus of Nazareth. Come on, can we get up? Give it up for Jesus today. <laughs> Woo. Now, 
as we take a look at the, the events of Jesus, a, a day in the life of Jesus, we're going to look at the miracles and the people that he impacted. We're also going to be looking at some video footage uh, from a series. There was two series, uh, two seasons uh, called The Chosen. Did any, anyone ever see any of The Chosen? If you haven't, uh, there's going to be a QR code that comes on the screen. You don't have to access this now, but it's on the TFH app. It'll be on the website. It will be everywhere. And as we look at a fairly brief clip from one of the episodes, then you can go online and check out the full episode or the season. You know, um, by some theological accounts, there were only 36 miracles recorded in the ministry years of Jesus, depending on the way you count, because many of them are repeated in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But what we find is the ministry uh, of Jesus and the miracles that recorded they're really just a sampling of what he did in those three years. There's some sound bites. We get a brief glimpse into the life and the ministry years of Jesus. There's so much more. I've always been fascinated by John 21, 25. Look at this. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Consider that right there. Now, John's using some hyperbole, but really he's making a point that we're just getting a glimpse of the impact of the ministry years of Jesus. There's other verses in the New Testament that if you read them slowly, you'll stop and consider the magnitude of what Jesus Christ did while he was here. Like Matthew 4, 24, news about him spread as far as Syria. People soon began bringing to him all who were sick and whatever their sickness or disease or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, and what? He healed them all. Matthew 8, 16. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed all the sick. Are you getting the picture here that complete villages would empty out Multitudes would gather. Historians believe crowds of greater than 20, 25, 30,000 people would line the shores around the amphitheaters of Galilee and they would pack out the villages in such a way that it wouldn't be long before Jesus could only minister in remote places. He would get in a boat, leaving a multitude to get some rest and travel across the lake. And by the time he got to the other side of the lake, there was already a multitude waiting for him. People were coming from as far away as Syria. Now think about it. In the ancient east, that's over 400 miles. Their travel on a good day would cover about 20 miles with your caravan and your animals. So people would load up the kids and the wagons and the, the donkeys or the camels, and they would travel for over three weeks through the blazing sun just to get a glimpse of the man they called Jesus Christ. Why would you do that? Because you heard about what he could do. Listen, if you had a paralytic daughter and you heard that Jesus was healing every paralyzed little girl in the region. How many know you'd load up the camels and get on the road? Because once you glimpse Jesus and what I want to do by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit in the few precious minutes we have together is to peel off some of the religious veneer that church puts upon Jesus. He's not a gold statue hanging on a cross. He's not a religious icon. He's not the leader of a religious movement. He's the man, the person, the passionate son of God who wants to walk with you. He's different than you think. He's greater than you think. He's more accessible than you know. He's closer than your breath. He's everywhere all the time. He is the omnipotent one. There is nobody like Jesus. Let's, let's talk about Jesus. Because some of you got some religion kind of saturating your mind and heart regarding the Son of God. And we're going to believe you're going to get free from some of that today in Jesus' name. <laughs> None of this stuff is on my notes. I'm just excited about Jesus. I'll get to the notes. They're pretty, they're pretty solid. You know, the ministry model of Jesus was actually quite simple. We find in Acts 10.38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Now, that's a pretty strong job description for the church right there. How, how many know if the church just did those two things? Go around doing good and healing all those who are under the power of the devil that the church would be unstoppable. And in fact, that is our job description because Jesus said in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. You know, as we launch this series, I, I asked myself this question. What's the one word that would describe the ministry years of Jesus? 
Now, obviously, he came to earth and he lived those 33 years with a goal and a focus in mind. And it would be that moment where he would stretch out his arms on the cross and become the atoning sacrifice so that your sins could be forgiven and you could be with the Father for all eternity. It's all about the cross. And then the resurrection from the dead, it, it verified and confirmed that he was in fact God. And then he dispatched the disciples to start the New Testament church. And 2,000 years later, plus, here we are, voila, the New Testament church because of the life and ministry of Jesus. But what would be a word that would describe those three years? I believe there's one, and it's this. It's compassion. If we were to articulate one word that would describe how Jesus moved among the people and how he moves among his church today, it would be the compassionate heart of God. See, Jesus has the ability to see what no one else can see, to see through the veneer, the failure, the outside that we see. He doesn't look at the outward things. He looks at the heart. Jesus had the ability to look past the demons in a demonized person and see the purity of the child that was in there before they were affected by the circumstances of life. He could look past the leprosy and see the purity and see a person who would be made whole. He could look past the adultery and see a pure heart and a person who is restored to purity. He could look past the rejection of society and see the value of people because Jesus sees the deep needs of the human heart. Here's a description of that in Matthew 9. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages, and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. As a pastor, I had to stop and say, what if we saw crowds as not another service or not another building or a campus or an income or a, accomplishing goals and charts, but people could be seen the way Jesus sees them, simply with a heart of compassion for what they've been through. They were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So for a few minutes today, we're going to consider one of the miracles of Jesus. And I want to show you a clip. And it comes from uh, Matthew 8, 2 through 4. Here it is. Suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean. And Jesus reached out and touched him. He said, I am willing. Be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus said to him, Shh, don't tell anybody about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you and take along an offering required in the law of Moses for those who've been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. You were speaking Egyptian. I lived there when I was a boy. Why were you there? We had to leave Bethlehem when I was two years old because of Herod. You lived in Bethlehem during the massacre of the innocents? I did. I know the story. Herod had every child in the area under the age of two killed. Yes, but it was very sad. Not to spoil this beautiful day or anything, huh? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's a leper. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. It's okay. Rabbi, 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 Rabbi you cannot. It's disease. You Please. Please. Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you could do. I know you can heal me if you are willing.
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. What can I, what can I ever do? No. Do not say anything to anyone. You don't seek your own honor. Please just do me this one thing. But what do I tell people? Go. Show yourself to the priest. Let them inspect you and see that you are cleansed. Make the proper offering in the temple as Moses commanded. And go on your way. Where's an extra tunic? Just one of you, just one of you. That's enough. Green is definitely your color. Oh. <laughs> Not too shabby. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's powerful. <laughs> One gets me every time. You know, something the leper said, a question he asked that caught my attention. He said, you do not seek your own honor. You don't seek your own honor. To, to perform a miracle like that, the human nature and tendency is you want recognition and honor and credit, but Jesus didn't need that. Perhaps that's a key to us moving more in the supernatural and the power of God is not to worry about who gets the credit and to defer all honor and glory to him and ask him that the same healing power that raised Jesus from the dead would flow through his church. Amen. Now, there's an interesting trait in the ministry of Jesus. You'll see multiple times when he'd heal someone or deliver someone, he would say, shh, don't tell anybody. And it's a theological question that goes unanswered in scripture as to why he did that. But there's some hypothesis or conjuncture that we can perhaps answer. And I think one of the reasons might be this. Jesus knew that once word got out that he was raising the dead and healing lepers and raising the lame people and opening blind eyes that the crowds would swell so large that he wouldn't be able to go into villages and cities. He'd have to stay in remote places. It would become overwhelming. It would stir up the Pharisees and the religious leaders and, and eventually expedite uh, his trial, crucifixion, and death. So perhaps he was trying to delay the inevitable of the crowds that would come. It's just a speculation. Or perhaps because he said, go show yourself to the Pharisees. Maybe it was an inside tip to the Pharisees that the Messiah you've been looking for for all these hundreds and thousands of years, I'm here. So Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Now, Jesus, um, one of the parts of the story I want to take a few moments in the time we have left together is to look at the fact that Jesus was comfortable around people that society rejected. He was comfortable around the outcast, the rejected, those ostracized from the community of worshipers. And one of the great misrepresentations or false narratives about Jesus throughout time and history is that Jesus was somehow the head of a religion, that Jesus is building a religious base. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Jesus was a revolutionary. He not only disrupted the religious systems of his day, but he completely dismantled them. That's why they hated him and made a plan to, to take his life. And you got to remember this. The original followers of Jesus, his small group, his community, the crowd that began to gather, they were a, a motley crew, weren't they? I mean, if you study it, it was the sketchy bunch. It was the pimps, prostitutes, thugs. It, it was the con artist. It was the outcast. It was the people you wouldn't expect to be at church. And those were the ones who were comfortable at the table around Jesus. Interesting, though, at some point in history, the church and church people gained a reputation of being uh, upstanding and wholesome and respectable, right? Church people. Uh, and circa 1940s, 50s, 1960s, back in that era, when people thought church folks are respectable. And, and now that reputation has swung the other direction, hasn't it? The last couple decades, especially the last decade that you've lived through, 
Bible-believing Christ followers have gained a reputation and been accused of being narrow-minded and judgmental and bigoted and right-wing and homophobic and intolerant and all these titles and labels that, once again, are not accurate. The broad brush of the way people see Christ followers. Let me tell you something about Jesus people. Jesus people have the same heart that Jesus had, and that is they love the outcast. If you're truly a Jesus person, you have compassion on those who have been rejected. There's something in you that wants to open up your table to those who've been rejected at other tables. And, you know, everyone knew then what we know now, and it's this, that religion and the rules of men applied to religion are only a repellent. People aren't looking for a list of rules and regulations or an organization or a denomination. They're looking for now what humanity has always longed and craved, and it's this, unconditional love, acceptance the way they are, and a place at the table with the Savior. And that's what Jesus' people do, and that's what they provide. Let me, let me give you, in our last couple minutes, let me give you two take-homes, two application points. The first one is this, as Jesus' people, can we join Jesus in eliminating religious and moral casting systems? Now, the Jews in Jesus' day, they envisioned a ladder that was reaching higher and higher to God. And the more scrupulous you obeyed the rules of the Sabbath and the dietary requirements, and the more you kept the law, the more you climbed up the ladder. And then you could look down on those who weren't keeping the law as well as you were, and they were further down the law. So maybe you had your dietary plan down so well that you felt you were really holy, and you're climbing closer and closer to God, but there's a, a new brother in the Lord, and he's he'll st still eating pork. So you look down, and you're like, get, get off the ladder, bacon boy. You know, <laughs> you, you don't deserve. Even the layout of the temple was an illustration and a description of a casting system. Now, at the furthest courtyard was the courtyard of the Gentiles. They weren't allowed in the place of worship. And among the Gentiles would have been the Samaritans, whom they called half-breeds, and there was a wall you couldn't go past. And then the furthest court for the Jewish people was for the ladies, and the ladies could stand at a distance and watch the priests go in and worship and minister to the Lord, but they couldn't go past another wall that was for the Jewish men. And then as you got closer, there was the outer court of the priest, and then the priests who were selected to go into the holy place and burn the incense and fill the table with showbread. But then there was the holy of holies where just one one priest once a year would go into the very presence of God. Jesus dies on the cross and the veil in the temple is ripped from top to bottom and he gives us all access to the very holy of holies. But we see on the furthest wall of the temple, there was actually historically, in fact, um, there were some signs that were discovered in the mid 1800s, a sign that was posted on the outside of the wall of the, uh, the court of the women telling the pagans and the Gentiles and the Samaritans not to go any farther. Here's a picture of the inscription on the sign that was posted. And it said this, to all pagans proceed under penalty of death. It was a sign posted on the outside of the church, of the temple. Now, how many of you, when you came in today at all locations, you saw some signs, right? You look marvelous, you're welcome here, sit by me, come on in, get a latte. We got some signage. What if we had one said, hey, if you're a pagan, don't cross this line or I'll kill you. I mean, that's not a good pro growth pro program for the church. But these are historically accurate signage that was placed on the outside of the temple. Now, someone might be thinking, well, wait a minute, Dave. Wasn't the design of the temple and the priesthood and the Holy of Holies and the holy place, wasn't that God's design? Yes, it was, in fact. It was his design. What was not God's design or intention was the signage. So here's something that's been happening in religion ever since. God makes a plan and a design, and then man gets a hold of it and adds rules and regulations and stipulations and requirements. Conjecture, but for your consideration. What if God actually wanted the priest to have a conversation with the Samaritans? What if he wanted his priests to go out to that outer wall and talk about how they could get closer to Yahweh and use the, the design of the temple as a way to introduce people to a loving and a living God? But there's something that happens in church and religion, and we always put up signs. There's always a demarcation that says, you can go this far, but you can't go any farther. And there was a clear casting system in the early Jewish life that said, if you're unclean, 
If you're a leper, and there was a lot of people that fit under the category of unclean that we won't go into today, but there was clear signage that either you're a desirable or you're an undesirable. You're either clean or you're unclean. And the quorum community of the Essenes, which is really just a large group of Pharisees, they written these rules. This will come up on the screen. No madman or lunatic or simpleton or fool, no blind man or maimed or lame or deaf man or physically deformed or any other undesirables shall enter the, into the community. This list also included women and minors, okay? And then Jesus shows up on the scene and he eats dinner with undesirables. He allowed a woman with a horrible reputation to wash his feet with her tears. He goes to dinner at the house of a guy whose name was Simon the leper. What did Jesus do? Jesus wasn't just a disturbance to the religious system. He was a revolutionary. We have no way to wrap our minds around how much he overturned the religious systems of his day because he said, I'm taking down all the signage. There is no such thing as the undesirables in my kingdom. Everyone is welcome and everyone is desired. And I wanna tell you something today. If you examine your heart, we all put up signs. We all have our way of putting stigmas on other people. And whether you can articulate or you have to allow the Holy Spirit to dig deep in your heart to see if there's areas of prejudice and there's areas where you've judged others or you think because of someone's past, they can only do so much in ministry or ascend so high in the body of Christ. Today, I wanna tell you, Jesus comes to break down every sign. He comes to break down every wall and every restriction. This is his message. You know, a stigma, I want everybody at all locations to see this definition. I'll read it out. It's a mark of disgrace that is connected to the events of someone's past. The origin of the word comes from our words, a brand or a tattoo, something that is permanent and connected with shame, disgrace, and unworthiness, a stigma. Many of you have lived with stigmas, and we could list a bunch of them, but perhaps you've been through a couple of divorces and you feel like that's a stigma on your life. Perhaps you've been through a business failure, a bankruptcy. I went through one of those early in life in ministry and it stuck with me and there's a, there's a stigma around uh, financial failure and bankruptcy. Maybe you carry the stigma of prolonged addiction or whatever it might be in your life and it's like a tattoo that people put on you, a tattoo of shame, disgrace, unworthiness. Remember this about people. They remember you in a snapshot, but your life is not a photo, it's a video. And people will catch a video or a snapshot of you 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and they remember you by that failure. And it's solidified in their mind and they'll put a stigma on your life. God doesn't do that. That's just a moment in the video. And after that stigma comes grace. And after that stigma comes forgiveness and redemption and a restored life. You're not who you used to be is what I'm saying. You know, as I was preparing this, I thought about all of our community at the Prison Church Network today, and uh, so many precious men and women now that join us every week from the 35 prisons in Napa State, and uh, a new women's prison is going to be opening up in, in Chino, California, and, and uh, yeah, I just, I love it, but you guys get this today at Prison Church Network, whether you're part of one of the live uh, services today, uh, one of the campuses, or whether you're in your dorm, your cell, you get this, and especially for those who have been paroled, right? And so many of you have been paroled, and you, you showed up here, one of our church plants. I know there's a, f a few uh, Prison Church Network parolees at uh, the Father's House, San Francisco, but you, you've, you've recognized this as you, you get out of prison, you go for that first job interview, or you go to buy the car or rent the house, and shortly on in the conversation it comes up and there's a stigma. Let me be quick to say this, that at the table of Jesus and at the table of the Father's house, eat neither the Lord nor anyone in our community is holding your past against you. There's a brand new beginning in Jesus. There's a place at the table. So these lepers, they lived with the stigma of being unclean and the Jewish people taught and understood that leprosy was a curse from God. So lepers, did, they didn't deserve attention. They didn't deserve medical care. They were ostracized and forced to live in communities outside the boundaries of the city. And if you came within a few hundred yards of them, the law required that they yell out, unclean, unclean. And this stigma was upon them. And I think the church has always put some kind of stigma on folks that we've determined are not 
clean or not desirable. And you could use your own illustration, but let me just give you one because I was raised in religions and denominations and probably part of the impetus of my rebellion is I just saw a lot of rules and stuff that I thought, that can't be God, I'm out. Um, but God, by his grace, drew me back. But I'll, I was raised in a, in a uh, denomination that will go unnamed. But one of the signs that they put up was this. Uh, you could do ministry, you could be saved, you could be a part of the church, but if you went through a divorce, okay, if you'd been divorced, you couldn't serve at a higher level. You couldn't be a bishop, a deacon, an elder, an overseer, a pastor if you went through a divorce. And so there was a sign that said, you're welcome here, but you're not welcome here. There was a sign that said, here and no further. And so when we started the Father's house, we took down that sign immediately. <laughs> Why? Because I believe full restoration is dependent upon full repentance. And if you will fully repent of no matter what it is, you can be fully restored to full capacity. There are no limitations in Jesus. Amen? I could talk about a lot of signs, but I'd start ticking people off. <laughs> which I actually enjoy. So pray for me because that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, it is. What I'm trying to say is Jesus didn't come to just move the boundary lines a little bit. He, he didn't come to accept uh, in measured doses the marginalized and the outcasts. Jesus came to destroy segregation. He came to destroy separation of every kind. He blew up the boundaries of religious exclusion. And he said, hey, guess who my crew is going to be? The most broken, the ones with the worst reputations, the ones farthest from the synagogue and from the Holy of Holies. In a moment when Jesus comes, he changes the game. So what do you say we be Jesus people? What do you say we break off the dead religion and the rules and the regulations and the signage that says you can only go so far if you're this or that or whatever your version of undesirable is? There's a writer that said, God, give us grace-healed eyes. Grace-healed eyes are eyes where you see people the way that Jesus sees them. And I believe if we'll see people through the, the eyes of Jesus here at the Father's house at all locations, that we'll see that no one is undesirable. No one has limitations. Their capacity is only known by God. Their potential is beyond anything we can imagine. They are precious sons and daughters, and he's just waiting for someone else in his family to pull out a chair at a table and say, you belong here. We're tearing down the signs in Jesus' name. I'm gonna ask the band to come. I'll give you the last thought today. As Jesus people, what do you say we join Jesus in embracing the broken and running toward the messes. You know, I, I watched that movie clip that you guys saw a minute ago. I, I've watched it probably 10, a dozen times, and every time I, I'm just, I'm captured by the compassion of Christ and the fact that he negated the religious rules of the day. You know, there was a, there was a law in place, you didn't go near lepers, and that'd be uh, admirable if, if you were talking about a contagious skin disease, but the reason they didn't go near them was because of the religious contamination of being made unclean. And there was no like hug a leper day. There was no day where, you know, you just, so Jesus, when he approached the leper, as you saw, he began to break the religious rules and understanding why. Let me get this clearly. Lean in and listen to this. Jesus runs toward what others run away from. That's what he does. The messes of your life that people go, oh, phew, train wreck over there. You know, I, yeah, I know that guy. I've heard about that guy. And we look away. We look away from severe addiction. And we look away from the messes that people get themselves into. And even if it's family, at some point, you just want to avoid the mess. Let me tell you something about Jesus. He never looks the other way. He runs toward the mess. And what if the church... Let me ask you, what if, before we close, then we're gonna have communion here at Vacaville. What if, what if we ran toward the messes like Jesus does? Let's think about this. And you're doing this so well in many areas, but I think we could do better. What if we ran more toward the messes of addiction? like you guys do at Celebrate Recovery every Monday night and the Life Change Retreat, and we're doing good there, but I think we could do better. What if we ran toward the mess of the broken foster care system in California? And we're doing that through Foster the City, but we could do so much better. 
What if we ran toward the mess of people that were impoverished and can't really even afford groceries and they need clothing and you're doing that well? I mean, through the storehouses and adopt a block and your generosity is feeding more than 40,000 people in our community every month. So I, I honor you for that, but I think we could run faster. But what about the messes nobody really gets close to? What about those messes that right now in our communities, in our world of gender confusion and just all the mess and the nonsense that, you know, in, in some people's minds, it gets political and there's certain things I should stay away from. And from this platform, it's more of a conversation. But I'm just saying, guys, there's, there's messes out there that you have been designed, anointed, commissioned to run toward. What if we run toward the mess instead of running away? I wonder if the Jesus people in the 21st century, the Jesus people in 2022 could gain a reputation like they had the first year of the church. Here's what they said about them. Behold how they love one another. They, they were opening up their homes. They were selling their property to feed people that didn't have any. They, they were getting rid of their wealth in order to make a place for people that were impoverished. And some of the Roman leaders were saying, how can we accuse them when they are taking care of our impoverished and our homeless better than we are. Rome, the leaders of Rome made those statements because there was, there was a love and a compassion. I'm, I'm just asking church, what do you say we consider the way of our savior and run toward the messes, be more like him? You see, I'll wind down with this thought. Jesus moved the emphasis from the holiness of God to the compassion of God without ever jeopardizing holiness. He remain, remain completely holy and he calls you to be holy as he is holy, but he removed the emphasis from keeping rules and living a lifestyle of holiness to mercy and compassion. And when we make that shift in our hearts and minds toward people, we will take down every sign that says there is no undesirables allowed to this sign. There is no one undesirable. There is no one undesirable. I pray today that we would become Jesus people and be more like him. And today, if you, if you say, Pastor Dave, I, I'm in a mess. In some ways, I, I feel like that, that leper. And, and maybe it's an addiction condition or a sin condition or pornography addiction or maybe it's something in your life you just feel like, ah, I, don't, I, I know I'm not supposed to be around those people, but if I could just get to the Jesus who allegedly is in the middle of them, I would fall at his feet and say, Lord, I know you're able, but are you willing? And what's Jesus gonna say? <laughs> Think about it. What would Jesus say to you? He threw all your mess at his feet. He'd say, ah, you know, there's a course you gotta go through. We're gonna need a year of seniority here at the church before we can deal with that. Got to meet some regulations and some stipulations now. Jesus is going to do what he's always done, done. That is, he's going to lay his hand upon you and say, I am willing, be healed. I am willing, be whole. I am willing. Amen.